you me as you use hard scenes. We're gonna let these guys introduce themselves, and then we're gonna go straight down to business. I'm Jez uh, from Utah Saints. I'm Tim from Utah Saints. Oh. So let's take it right back, guys. Are we taking that to 91 or are we going past and we going beyond them sort of times yeah. as well? Go on, guys. Go, go well, on, well, on. Basically, we, 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 we met and started Utah, we started Utah Saints in 1991. Uh, but prior to that, um, Tim had uh, entered the DMC Championships at his bedroom when he was um, 17 and got the finals. Uh, Respect, I mean, yeah. 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 the cash money one. You got the fans, but you didn't know. 88. Yeah, so I did that. I did that out of the bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> 87 eight, eight, I entered it and came nowhere because I like, never played in front of anybody. Because I was like, nervous and made my needle jump and then took another 12 months. Did it again and then uh, got into the semi finals. But um, I was only uh, 17 and uh, I was. Brave. I was living in Leeds and uh, to do to go to the semi finals, I had to go down to London. And uh, I couldn't get anybody to go with me. And I, I just thought, I'm, I'm not going to go on my own. I wish I'd gone that, but I was 17 years old and you know, to go to London and just enter the competition on the own. Especially uh, DMC. I, yeah, yeah, I bottled huge. out. I bottled out. So um, but it's kind of. It's cool, I got to the semi finals, got my jacket, and got my freak size. So, <laughs> so I have 17 years old as well. Went up with so many friends. Yeah, I did. I did. I met Chad Jackson and, uh, yes. and you know, all those people. And uh, so, yeah, it was a good experience. And then I, then I kind of got a job after that, DJing and club for like £20 a night. So. And then, so he was doing that, and I was at school doing a mobile disco, doing uh, like uh, just weddings and uh, retirement parties and 18th and anything that sort of paid the bills. and. Um, and then we both started putting out sort of records. I was putting out more industrial kind of electronic What production records. yourself? Yeah, Your just, just on our own little labels, like the rest of a thousand copies. And um, Tim was doing like kind of... And there's this label called um, Ozone, which was like... Right, yeah, yeah. Chef, based out of Sheffield, it was kind of like, um, you know, quite a, quite a few cool little things going on. And uh, so, I, you know, I've got a few, so I just, you know, sort of little tenor tracks out of it, and sort of doing like, you know, three or four hundred each one. And, so that, that was cool. We you know, I was putting out industrial kind of electronic records and they were doing about 300. And at the same time, we were both promoting nights. And um, uh, I was promoting a club in, in Leeds called The Gallery. And we had everyone come through there from like Carl Cox, Pete Tom, right, yeah. Sasha, the, the famous Sasha used to DJ in the basement. <laughs> step right at the very beginning of, of time, I think it was. And, uh, and then we started both uh, DJing at a club in Harrogate. And I was doing the I was in the Saturday night and it was more like kind of funk and uh, kind of funk, funk based, yeah. really funk hip hop based and uh, Tim was doing the Friday night which was house based and we started sort of swapping tapes and um, then we thought oh let's, let's try going to the studio together because we both we were coming out and doing the same thing from different angles and the first thing we did was a uh, track called What Can You Do For Me mm -hmm. we pressed a thousand copies of that onto, uh, it was meant to be bright orange vinyl, but I didn't know Tim very well at the time, obviously, because we were just met and um, I didn't know that he was red, green, colour blind. And right. he, he, was, he was choosing the colours to mix together for the vinyl, and it came out kind of this vomit colour. But it worked in our favour, we had this vomit colour vinyl, and uh, we passed a thousand of it and it just went mental. It was just right time, right place, right track, and it, it, three months later we were on top of the pops and stuff, and it just went bam. In the charts and everything. Yeah, just so, so we just, we just ended up hanging on to the coat tails of Utah Saints for, for a long time. Is that where you decided that you were going to use that to perpetuate where you are today, or well, yeah, did yeah, you I realise mean, you were going to have the longevity of uh, No, I don't, we had no plan going into it, other than we happened to bring different things to the table, and every band I've been in prior to that, it was the reason the bands kind of fall apart is that people bring the same things to the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So within Tim we've always brought different things to the table and that's so that's why it's kind of kept going because uh, after that that record we were kind of a one hit wonder technically and then we had another hit a year after got something good and then it was just came out again a couple of years ago. Yeah. And another hit God believe in me. Yeah. Video yeah. Nice one. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, I'll tell I think the point thing that they were, what those records are is that they were then you know they ended up kind of being pop records but they never started off being pop records and just very much underground. We just made them and we did like a thousand poppers on the first thing. And back in that at that time, um, you know, radio, radio kind of didn't really support the dance music that was kind of you know, people were kids were going out on the Saturday night to the grave around Manchester and you know Blackburn and there were these like these massive records that were getting played and you know and records were charting from out of nowhere like these kids who were making records in the bedroom purely on sales from, you know, from 
from the shops open Monday morning too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No downloads, it was like kids would go out and buy Buying well. records, you have to. Yeah, you'd go and buy vinyl and, and you know, CDs was sort of kicking in then. Um, but those those records were kind of flying into the top ten and beating well established artists. Like, mm -hmm. remember we were, we were signed to the same label as like Faith No More. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, and, and they had quite a lot of money behind them on the video and everything. You know, and we flew to the charts like two or three places above them. And that was just purely for my kids to go out and find the record. And, you know, we had a bit of support on sort of specialist shows on Radio 1 in the evening, but we didn't have daytime mainstream coverage. Yeah, so and that, that was the same with a lot of bands, things like SL2, Prodigy, yeah, true, true. all those bands started out like that. And they used to just go around the country and play these raves and people bought the record. So, you know, when you look at back at it now, you kind of think these are like pop records, which they kind of, they are, but they never started off that way, yeah, so it's yeah, kind yeah. of important, you know, because we never set out, out to sort of make records to be in the charts, you just, everybody was making records. It becomes it. popular, so that's yeah. the only way that yeah. can really go. So it's, quite, it's cool, it is. It's, it's like, I'm not saying that it's, you know, I'm not really against poverty, I, mean, I, like, I like all sorts of type of things, but it's kind of important to me, sort of, people today to see the sort of history of all those records, that, um, you know, and it was just a really exciting time, and, you know, it's, it, it is again now, but it was a really exciting time. You know, there were a lot of big bands inside at that time. Like, yeah, yeah. Like Prodigy, Moby. 1991, 92 was like a good, what they call a golden era, especially yeah. with like electronic yeah. music. Because yeah. was, um, like we're going to touch on now, the, the equipment that was about there was very much fresh, and people only just started to experiment yeah. with things like the Akai. Yeah. You know, that was really big back then. Cubases only just yeah. started to poke its head through things like that. So you had them sort of programs. How did you, which program did you use and which ones did you find that were easiest? We started out with um, the proper old school. We started with um, a Yamaha CX5 computer, uh, which you never hear of it anywhere. But basically, it was a MIDI computer made by Yamaha, and they got as far as the Mark II and then abandoned it. But it used to, I thought it cost a fortune, and it had a, a step editor in it. It took forever to program, basically. Um, so we started out with that. Um, uh, Roland SH 101, which is a bit of a classic now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and an Akai um, S612, which is predated the 900, which was. Right, like, that's um, what I remember the 900. So the 612 worked on quick disks, which were these tiny redundant little disks. You could get one sample about two seconds on one side. <laughs> and it had sides, and you had to remember which side to put the sample on. <laughs> and then it had sliders for the start point and the end point, and that was it. Wow. So it was, like, it was like real proper. And then, then we. Uh, we kind of graduated to work in the studio and, and we could use a, an S900, that kind of yeah. And their Atari. And uh, that was when Cubase was just starting out and it used to come on one floppy disk as well. So I like one make. And the Ataris were like 520 make. <laughs> like, so the whole, the whole thing sounds ridiculous now. But um, in a way, it was, it was very liberating now because um, it, it suddenly made the sample just revolutionise like, absolutely everything. Oh, yeah, yeah. And it made, it meant you didn't. Even though bands were already sort of doing that with, um, well, especially all the hip hop bands were, were kind of putting things together on tape and stuff, the sample just made it so much quicker. Even though at the time it took you to take us ages to get things in time and you can do it really fast now. But at the time it was but, so way advanced using the Akai, it's like you had to use way up on the game if you knew sort of on the stuff now to use it. Yeah, we were, we were lucky, we were lucky to be honest, and we were just geeky, to be honest. You know, that's, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's how you have to be a bit geeky. And, and, um, you know, I still find myself now having conversations with people at like two in the morning about bits of technology. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, this is all wrong. <laughs> should we pass so, it? Yeah, should we pass it? It's, it's, always, it's always been like that with you, with you should I say. We've, we've always kind of been into the, into the gear side of things and just like trying to, um, trying to keep up, basically. Mm -hmm. So after that, after you started getting the re really into the flow of the music and you realised that you've made generated a name for yourselves, where did you think, because obviously the hardcore was, not obviously, but hardcore was dying around 94, 95, yeah. And yeah. a new generation of music was coming in, so where where did it find for you that we're quite happy what we're doing with the well, well, on this particular route? Uh, to be honest, we were uh, a bit... Um, we kind of said we lost the plot to be frank, because basically we didn't expect to get sort of the whole fame, I'm not saying we got really famous, but we became <coughs> quite well known because we put the chant you you Utah Saints on the record and we nicked that idea of the KLF because the KLF were always name checking themselves. They nicked it off loads of hip hop tracks where they were always name checking themselves. So it was just like, you know, it was just a thing, but it happened for us, it happened to 
be something that people would still remember now, you know, almost 20 years later. Yeah, of course, yeah. So, um, we got to a point where we were doing quite well with all the uh, records in America and stuff, and we suddenly had a lot of attention from um, the business. And in, in America, the business, when I say the business, I mean like record company, uh, reps, and a lot of, you know, people who come to see us getting a plot on what they thought we were and stuff. And over in America at the time, um, big industrial band Nine Inch Nails were number one. Right. And because we had a hard bridge to us and we sampled guitars and stuff a bit, we sampled Slayer on the first album. Over there, they were really trying to make us into Nine Inch Nails. And over here, the care left had split up and uh, there was quite a lot of pressure on us to kind of try and pick up that. Yeah. But really, we just needed yeah. to be left alone to do what we did. And we, but we bought into the whole thing. We thought, okay, well, if we go, if we've done all right in, in sort of basically a home studio in Leeds, if we go into a big studio in London, then we're going to make better music. And although we made, a, we think, interesting music, it wasn't particularly commercially viable in everybody else's opinion. Because what happens when you get to that level is, if you're not really strong, which we were quite insecure about music because it, you know we never really understood why it sold in the first place. And if you make anything, you're a bit insecure about whether it's any good. That's what keeps you going with your game. You know, yeah, keep, sure, keeps yeah, you up yeah. things all the time. You have to be a bit unsure if it's any good. And um, so we were taking a lot of input, way too much input from, from everybody. And um, as a result, we made quite an unfocused album. Um, Is that the reason why the, the yeah. gap between the yeah. albums? Yeah. Well, we made we finished the second album, but. And at one point, while we were working on it, uh, the Americans were in and uh, the record, record company was in, the UK record company was in, and everyone was dead excited. They were going, oh, this is going to be, quote, the thriller, the dance music, there's 10 singles on it, and blah, blah, blah. And then it, it, it just sort of all started falling to bits. We kind of overcooked it, to be honest, and everyone was going, are you sure this is right? Are you sure that's right? And you start dissecting the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Then you take a step back and you think, actually, this is, by the time this comes out, it's going to be out of date. And then you start, and then I'll take, <laughs> and then, uh, Liam Howlett dropped um, Battle of the Land, wasn't it? Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. And we were just like, because he's like a total genius, yeah. basically. And But he was also our benchmark, because we all started the same. We used to pass each other really, and go in that raid, literally. We'd turn up as they were coming out, and, or, we, or they'd turn up as we were going out. And so so we, kind of, we kind of, we don't know him very well, not big mates or anything, but we've got total respect for them, and, and he's really, really, really good and really clever and so when that, that album came out we just looked at our album and thought it's not as good but well, what we should be doing is just thinking of ourselves and thinking of, is our album better than the previous album which it was. But anyway that's a long way of saying we made an album that didn't work for us, didn't work for the record company so to get out of a, a legal situation like that takes about three years. Before we knew it we were sort of in the year 2000 and it's been and we finished another, our third album, which did come out, but it was actually our second album that was released. And um, we're super proud of that, but, but when that came out, it was just totally the wrong time for us. There was nowhere for us to fit at all. And so we just felt quite out of it, you know. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. So we were basically at that point, then we, we sort of just sort of danced all the music for you guys for a bit. And um, we just we, we kind of had a few things with the manager and we wanted to get out. Yeah, just sort of stopped for a bit and so what, what we did we just kind of started at night and just went back to DJ and just thought you know we'll, there's a lot of time in the studio it's kind of like you don't we weren't, we weren't going out we weren't seeing a lot of the DJs we weren't you know, we were hearing kind of always called music so you know we thought right we'll get back to the DJ and we started with like this little night at Leeds which was it wasn't meant to be a big like, club night or anything it was just for place me and just to play records on Saturday night Right, but it could be a hip hop and drum bass and everything. We didn't just, build ourselves as you say, we just started deep. We have the little right back to square one, we'll start from the roots. Yeah, yeah, and yeah we just did like DJ and, and, and it, 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 was, it was quite funny because it ended up, um, we ended up starting to sort of go out and do some like, little DJ gigs at some other places. So when we weren't there, we were thinking, yeah, we, we better put somebody who called them to cover it because he's going to play kind of quite varied music and that. Otherwise, the one week that we didn't do it, we just had the club put somebody in. 
next the week after we get annoyed with really, sort of strange requests, but just it using it like it. Like, <laughs> like, really. So, so we thought, right, we'll put some point guests in when we're not there. And, and it, you know, one of our first guests was um, DJ Bill Blackie. Right. So we, um, he was at the back of that time, he was kind of quite early on his career. Right, right. You know, and, and that worked really well. And so then, you know, because there was a kind of a soft sort of spot for sort of the DMC things, we started booking people. You know, we started going through the DMC champions like Cash Money, and yeah, yeah. all those sort of people, and, um, and it just kind of escalated and escalated, and then you know got to that time another club in, in Edinburgh, you know, got to play on people like Justice, High Contrast, Zinc, all, all everybody done, Scratch Pro, but you know what I mean? <laughs> just uh, anything that we thought, oh, they're cool, we, you know, there wasn't really house. We, we but Soul Wax on the house, you know, we put Soul Wax on very very early on in the day, and so you know, basically our club. Pretty small capacity, so what, the only way we could kind of make it work was we, we had to be on top of our game. We just try and get all these people really early on. Yeah, 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 yeah. So by the time they blew up, like, mm -hmm. the because of all Yeah, so we just kind of like, so we booked all these people just really early on, and um, so it was cool because I said we like, were like too many DJs and did them in these and you know, we can pay for hardly anything. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, and the same with our like, justice, and you know, so it's, it's cool. And, um, yeah, but that, that made us kind of pull back in love with music again. And, um, but I think that's the whole point yeah. with music though, really, because, you know, especially with your guy listening to your story there, it's like, you've come from, you know, the ground roots and building music that, you know, everybody loved at that time, yeah. and then you've kind of, like, fallen out with, not out, out of yeah, love, yeah, but no, you're you, right. you've fallen yeah. out of sync with what's going on, yeah. and then you've had to come back where you started yeah. to regain where yeah. you actually were yeah. in the first place. Exactly right. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly yeah. right, and, and we realised that, really, we, we need to, to, what's most inspiring for us is stuff that's a bit left of field. Like, mm -hmm. there's a night called Sugar Beat, and we, we, do, we did it every week for 10 years in Leeds. Uh, and it's, we've done it once a month in Edinburgh for five years. Right. And like Tim says, we just started putting on people that we, we thought were interesting. So, on top of uh, things like Justice or the two DJs, we'd also put on things like Elbow Ken Cross DJ set. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. The Doves as well. Yeah. And um, just that was just like interesting. Um, Music really that, was, that really inspired our music to get us a conference. Is that where you started stuff. bringing out the live element with your music? Is that where you just like, opened up? No, well, right back in the day, we we were actually we put together a five-piece band right. in '93 and went on tour with it, and uh, we did three and a half months to it, mainly for America to be honest. Because in America, the whole rave thing didn't quite catch on the way it did here, mm -hmm. and also even here as well, '93, '94 sounds ridiculous now. In 1994, you could not get away being on the main stage at a festival uh, and being a DJ. You, yeah, had, you had to have something else going on. So we had a whole, we used to take out, uh, we had two drums because people were always like seeing people. Like, hit, solo hit, drums. Yeah. <laughs> so two drums and um, Tim was, instead of lead guitarist, he was on his decks. So we had, the decks is like a, a featured instrument uh, and I had a MIDI guitar and I had a keyboard player. Like, and we did three and a half months around America touring. Uh, we spotted you two. 10 big stadium shows as well, right. uh, which you know credit to them because they, they've always been trying to get on what's going on as well at the time. And um, so we, we did actually put the whole life thing together. And then we came when we started going out again as Utahs. We thought rather than put a band together, it's much more acceptable now to be DJs and stuff. And obviously Tim with his DMC background better than me, so I've got the effects and he's got his. Um, He's got the features that are next. Yeah, so it kind of it kind of works that way. Some point in the future, I don't know if we get if and when we get start putting more and more music out, get bigger, probably put more live elements and stuff. In. We've always been, we've always had great ambitions as a live thing. Like we were trying to back in the day. We, again, it sounds ridiculous, but we used to, when we toured here, uh, we took out um, I think it was like twenty or twenty four TV screens. Again, so it, so it, it was really high tech at the time, and it was the whole point was like low graphics on it to try and make the whole stage look like it was moving. Right, so, yeah. Composition around the band and stuff, and um, and then we were trying to get a marquee put up inside venues, so you projected on the top of it, and inside the marquee where we stood, it would go from like night to day or rain and so we always. We always have great ambitions that it's purely out of money, so I don't know, I don't know how it's going to develop from here, but at the moment we're quite happy. So let's bring you up to the present now, so 
I've, um, I've got an album coming out, I've got the singles coming out. Yeah, I mean, hopefully we've, we've, we kind of have the, the record, uh, something good got something released. Something good, so yeah. Obviously got released um, in 2008. Um, and, uh, so, like, the last sort of few years, we've just been basically in the studio doing, um, we started doing quite a few remixes just to get back into it, really. You know, remix on D Clan, done Frank and Killer Ball. Um, yeah, just just quite a few little projects, and we're in like a really good like um, little studio at Leeds, where there's just some like really good things going on. It's kind of like, you know, like twelve other sort of DJs. I think mean, Slim, um, he's just moved in. His whole bomb squad studio. So, you know, so it's like it, it's cool because we're all just kind of go out of the room and it's like you know just vibing off each other and just swapping little ideas about gear. And, you know, some days it's bags, we just end up talking and stuff. It's like being back at school yeah. all over again. Yeah, so, <laughs> so it's a really exciting time for us, and you know, so we've got our heads down, we've just sort of been making, sort of making new tunes, so, you know, hopefully um, we'll get stuff out of this, so probably next few months, really. Cool. Let's talk a bit about uh, this Something Good video, because I, I, I absolutely just wasn't off that. Say, tell us a bit about the story behind that. Well, the Running Man. So it's in, the Running Man video, so for, for some good away, when it was coming out again, it, um, there's a lot of interest in who was going to sign it, and um, we actually we re-recorded the vocal and everything because it's not Kate Bush on, on the song. Yeah. It, so it's we, we done, and um, we needed what a video, a new video for it, and we signed to Miniature Sound. And Miniature Sound uh, for, have a certain type of video that they make, uh, which generally involves um, girls in bikinis and um, like the Eric Prince video. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. yeah. So, and we've never been that comfortable with, it sounds really weird this, but we've never been that comfortable with girls and bikinis. That's not true. Yeah, I've got girls and bikinis, not in videos. Yeah, we've and Not in videos just for the sake of, sake of doing it. We thought there's got to be a spin on that somehow. And um, we started getting, ministry were getting these ideas, because that's, to be fair, that works for them, so they know what they're doing. But we just kept saying, oh, we're not for that idea, we're not for that idea. We're just like, yeah, it's out of well, our comfort zone, really. Yeah, so. it's out of our comfort zone. So, yeah, so the only way around it for, was to kind of go with, you know, some other kind of thing that would... Some other theme. Yeah, yeah. Just, have, just have an element of, like, sort of humour in it that, um, you know, that just kind of get them a little bit off the idea yeah. of that kind of thing, because all the initial ideas that were coming in were like Utah Saints so in the club and these girls and that, and we were like, right, now we've got to do something else. And we went down and sat down and talked to them, and to be fair, you know, they totally came forward and listened and that, so then they came back with a few ideas. And one of the ideas was, um, the running man. Yeah, it's quite uh, class. Uh, Absolutely class. You know, and, 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 you know, and on paper, it's weird because you look back at it and I think, oh, it's a genius idea, but when you actually read the script for it at first on paper, me and Jess were like, oh, I don't know if it's going to work. Yeah, no, which it was good. Because also, they wanted to, <laughs> it's quite funny, they was going, oh, where should we set it? And I'm from Carlisle originally. Oh, so right. I said, oh, I should set it in Carlisle. <laughs> The guy's from London who was doing it, I don't think he'd ever heard of Carlisle. <laughs> so in his head it became Cardiff. So that's how, that's how it ended up in So we turned up for the video shoot because there were just Welsh flags everywhere. And we were all right, like that would do. It's just so the whole thing was kind of It works really well though. It was just it? a catalogue of happy accidents yeah. Really, yeah, for all to come. And it's very so. funny people that haven't seen the, 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 the video as well. It's like set like in the 80s, yeah. it's very retro. Yeah, it is really retro. And the, the guy starts dancing and you know, there's a couple, one, two go over, they start doing the same dance, and then before you know it, everyone's it's dancing. Really man, yeah. And some of the, I love some of the comments, you know, while they're dancing, where's this guy come from? It's absolutely <laughs> amazing. <laughs> it was, we wanted, we wanted something that, that just was a, um, you had to be able to do it, and, and unless you wanted something with um, dancing ladies in it. So we're all happy, everybody's happy. <laughs> So let's take us to 2010 now, so what we expect from I know we've spoke a bit about the singles, but are you still guys touring? You still well, yeah, very much. We've, we've, we've kind of the last sort of few years we've been sort of everywhere, like States, Australia. It's like the next week I'm off to um, Dubai. Um, you know, every weekend really we've kind of been out. But the cool thing about that is it's just it, it totally keeps you on top of your game. Because, yeah, sure. Yeah. You know, we, 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 like last weekend we got to put on this insane sort of girl in Birmingham. Like, so everybody from James B, uh, you know, Dylan Farmer, um, you know, a lot of sort of drum based things, Sam Warriors, and, you know, you're on, you're on this lineup, and so you, you know, you, you know you're going to be playing out before or after one of these sort of people. So you just got totally on top of your game, and on top of your music, and um, so it kind of makes, just makes me enjoy.
said that it's a lot of weight. Sounds so like you guys have really yeah. fallen back in love with what Yeah, yeah we are, but I mean, it's funny because it actually makes it a bit more difficult for us because we've always turned down anything to do with like old school or those kind of the classic nights and that. Not because we don't like the music, it's just that, that we're not stuck there, we just carried on moving. Carried on moving. Yeah. So, whereas it would actually probably be easier for us to go into a club and just play anthem, 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 anthem. And uh, from, from back in the day, and then move on. But really, we, we kind of stick ourselves in the middle of a, of a line of light and just go on before Saturday Warriors, which is what we did on Sunday. And um, it does make it's kind of stressful for us, but it does improve our music. I mean, so, seeing the DJ, and I've you know seen the DJs. We go to clubs since the nineties myself. So you know, it was very much the DJs came and they'll play. You know, you probably if you go to a jungle night, you know, yeah. expect. Yeah. If you go to a hardcore night, you know, expect. Yeah. Nowadays, it seems to be more reflective. Yeah, yeah. Totally. So you, you don't even though you have like a range of DJs from like end times to you guys, to yeah. DJ hype. Yeah. You know, they'll have a whole heap of it people. works. Like, yeah. yeah, very much. So because yeah. people are a lot more open to it, back then. Yeah. You never got away with that in the nineties. No, you're right. And that, I think that's the brilliant thing about music at the minute is. Um, but you can exactly what you just said is that rather than going to because it used to in my head and sometimes you go to a night and you get six hours of, and sometimes you get six hours just repeating themselves yeah, yeah. because you get another DJ coming and play it or more or less exactly. yeah, yeah. so, but now you can go in and you're right you can get something you can get dubstep, house, drum bass, uh, fidget, bit of hip hop and then you know back to some house and that and it just all works. Yeah, it does and, work. and that's that's down to scope for DJs as well, can, can put it together like that and make it work. But I've been to some really exciting nights where the lineup doesn't look like it'll work on paper but it just totally flows. It totally really I works think out. I think as well like the music today is like if you, you know if you put a record on sort of made today against a record made in the 90s, it's like you know the distant production and all the records stand out so much and and the key thing which is making all these records also work together is, is like the, the old records you make, you know, the type of genres, you know, drum bass, dubstep, even like fidget, hip hop, and that. There's one thing they're all got common, everything based around the bass line. Yeah, yeah, true. At the moment. And, uh, but you're getting, you know, all clubs are kind of get to have better sound systems, music's getting produced better, and it's just like, it's all the same speech, everything's about the bass again. Yeah, that's what it should be. That's how it belongs. But whether you said, but whether you like, you know, drum bass or dubstep or hip hop and that, it's got that come up for me. Every every kind of big track within those genres, all about the bass line. Right, guys, I'm gonna have to cut it there. Cool. Nice one. Yeah, you nice. absolutely brilliant talking to you guys. Nice Glad we've gone down memory lane. Nice Wish nice you nice all one. the best in the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah.